it's, it's a little, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a little awkward now because so many people have left, but we've heard about a lot of uh, uh, amazing opportunities uh, at the meeting, and you've also heard that the funds are not uh, um, uh, infinite. So I guess a question to ask is, among the various things you've heard, what are the dependencies? And so are there some of these that uh, where if certain things don't happen, then the rest of it can't go forward anyway. And so in terms of thinking about priorities, which are the things, uh, with, you know, we don't want to throw, the problem with asking for priorities is they're always ones that are lower. So let's talk about the higher priorities. Uh, which are the things that need to go forward in order to make progress in this field? Uh, and, and without which the other things that we would like to see happen are, like, are not likely to happen. Is that a reasonable question, if a hard one? Nobody's going to want to answer this, I know. But. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a stab at this. I think, I think I heard some consensus on the value of continuing to build the catalog. Uh, th there are examples, Manolis Kellis, using from the roadmap data, talked about the connection between Alzheimer's and the immune system, which came out of, you know, unbiased production of data from many different tissues. And if you had focused on Alzheimer's in the brain, you would miss the you would have missed the immune connection. It was a very very stimulating you know um, talk. And uh, so I think there's an argument that says I don't know who said it earlier that you really um, don't know what you're missing until you, you sort of see it. And, you, you, um, and, and to some extent, that catalog is going to be dependent on the practical realities of what cells you can get. Uh, um, and so gr groups need to be able to get access to, um, to, to, to the material if they're going to make a proposal. So somewhat it will be directed by, you know, what's out there in the community already. So by its very nature, the project has to connect to the community for samples. I think that's, that's the way it's been in the past. It'll probably be the way it will be in the future. But, but the systems have been evolving. There are all sorts of organoids now. My colleagues at Salk have kidney organoids, brain organoids, et cetera. And so I think there are, there are other ways to get these, but I think getting at this catalog is going to be very valuable, not in a way that you can couple it with function. I think they're not either or. I think if you pick the right system, you, and of course this is a ground up actually, right? Because investors are going to propose different systems you know, if the project goes forward. And if, you're, if your system couples with an assay that's high throughput, so be it. We want to get to that encyclopedia. I think all the PIs think that that's an important goal, but it has to be coupled to the continued development of the catalog. So, Well, and in fact, if you're going to have a, a path for uh, community-generated cell types to enter a pipeline once the, tech, once the cells and the technology are available, there has to be that infrastructure, I think, of, of some, production act, some level of production activities. Right. <clears throat> so we, have, let me just jump in back. We, we have a project, Mike Snyder and I, this California Institute of Regenerative Medicine has a stem cell genome center. And that project is to enable genomics in the stem cell community. And some of the funds from the, from the, uh, from the center flow to those investigators to prepare the cells. Okay. That, that was on a competitive basis that those groups were chosen say, hey, here's an interesting biological system will help you do the genomics, and you got to have, you know, all the cells. So there are groups that have, you know, hundreds of different, you know, cardiomyocytes or whatever. It's not necessarily a cell catalog, but focused around more around the disease. So I think that's a reasonable thing to do. The groups that have the ability, either they're brought into the consortium directly as part of a proposal, as we, as we did, being rented with Jamie Thompson, or as John has a lot of collaborators getting samples you know, within the within his community in Seattle, that it, it it'll have to be an integral part of the project either way. Yeah, and I, we've you know, as you as many of you know from the uh, sequencing program, uh, we've we're, we're we're trying to invent ways to uh, engage as much of the community as possible uh, in in developing those uh, those samples opportunities. Uh, 
I'll, I'll, be, I'll be over there. The other one I wanted to comment that I wanted to, or the other priority that I wanted to mention, which we haven't, but well, well, we, I guess we have talked about, but not explicitly as a priority, was the, uh, the, the uh, uh, collection and, and vetting of data through the DAC and the DCC. It seems like this, this cannot go forward without a robust effort for those two, for those activities. Is, that, that, is there a fairly good agreement on that? No. So, yeah, I just want to stress out one point. If indeed the goal is to move forward and having more cells added to the list, which I fully agree with, um, and this is something others have said, and I'll just voice my, I'll put my opinion in the same direction. It's not that they need to be fully characterized, but characterized on a subset of specific uh, features that need to be defined uh, so that we know exactly which ones we should prioritize. And at the same time, keep investing in in-depth characterization of a small subset of cells uh, such as what we have right now for the FG2, the K562, and the GM12878 cells. I think those are, you need to stretch the grid on both ends, not just on one end. Will? Yeah, I guess I wanted to echo the idea that sort of ENCODE, uh, the Tier 1 lines are incredibly valuable for, they're, they're kind of like model, model organisms for cells, right? Um, we choose a, a few model organisms because they're useful and you, and you uh, explore them and, and ENCODE is choosing a couple cell lines to go really, really deep on. And at least as a, as a methods developer, that's incredibly powerful to have that um, mountain of, of data uh, to, to synergize with when developing potentially new things. And I, I would also argue that just as far as like just understanding cell biology, it almost doesn't matter what kind of cell you choose in some sense. To, to understand these broad um, sort of organizational principles. Uh, but, but going into those tier one lines and trying to get at functional validation or magnitude of effect for these regulatory elements w would be very, very powerful, I would argue, um, and add another dimension, a validation dimension, to these um, cells that are sort of model organisms of cells. Um, and, and I think that that, I think fills a lot of the principles of what ENCODE should be um, in terms of sort of um, breadth first uh, uh, understanding of a small number of things and al also depth first but much less uh, dense as, as was just recently said. Thanks. Well, any comments on that? Yeah, well, I mean, Will said it, but I'll just echo it. Is, is, you know, I, th I think there was consensus around it. Maybe there wasn't, but validation as a as a theme, right? Meaning that that as as a more significant component of what's going on, even if it's directed at validation of things that were predicted by encode one through three, right? I strongly agree that there was a consensus around the notion of validation. What I struggle to understand is what people actually mean when they say validation. And I asked that actually multiple times because I, I know what I mean I what for I mean very specific purposes that I happen to care about. I actually don't even want to say it. I don't think it's relevant here. But I'd what? love to know what it is that is in the back of people's minds when they say the word validation, and it's usually coupled to the F word function. So it's kind of... And, and I don't think it should be... Oh, of it. I don't yeah. understand what it is. And I, I don't think it should be overly specified, meaning it, it, no, but it's a sort of thing that is, know, one, one could look at a bunch of... Sure, yeah. Yes. Know the spectrum of what it means for someone that something has been validated. Yeah. yeah. So one of the discussions that we've been having with our council is it's really awkward. I can't see Aviv and I can't see the people. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, 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 it is about um, you know the balance between top down and bottom up, investigator initiated and consortium and so forth. So are are some of these various uh, things that we've talked about, including perhaps validation? The kinds of grants that could come in, if we, if we would say we're going to set aside some portion of the ENCODE budget, whatever that is, whatever the total is and whatever that set aside is, to, uh, th that we anticipate that there will be really interesting applications that will come in that won't be part of a cooperative agreement, but they'll be working on ENCODE type problems such as these validation problems that would use ENCODE data sets in an interesting system and, and, and look at validation. And could these be reviewed effectively at a study section like GCAT? I'm, I'm really getting down into the weeds now. 
But these are the kinds of things that we're going to have to start grappling with starting at 4.30 this afternoon. Uh, right? I mean, seriously. So, um, you know, or, or is this the sort of thing, you know, there, so now you're asking that we, de we describe in a program announcement or something what we mean by validation versus letting people come in with ideas about what they mean by validation, and there may be different ones. Uh, and so they, and and so we could do that, and we could either have a uh, uh, have uh, our review office set up a review of people who are really thinking about this, where the reviewers are really thinking about this, or let it come in through through CSR. So just yeah, John. I think if you um, <coughs> maybe made it one level higher and didn't call it validation, and for example called it a program in in-depth functional studies of encode elements, I think that's something that could catalyze. Uh, people, you know, generally, because you don't want to, I think the word validation. I was using validation as an example yeah, of the sort yeah. of thing that might come in under this. Yeah, so in-depth, but that in-depth functional characterization and, you know, to include, essentially becomes de facto validation. But that, I, I think that would organize, rather than just wait for the stuff to come in, that would organize a response, because a lot of people are interested in it. Go down here first. So, I mean, I, uh, Paul, okay. Um, so I think that what you suggested sort of initially that instead of um, having a small group of people decide what validation means or what assays are the best, to, to sort of put out, a, you know, an RFA, so put out something and say, we want ideas. Give us your best ideas and, and have a grant review panel look at the ideas. Because, I mean, we've talked about this over and over again in the past day or so that we all agree that validation and characterization of these things is essential, but there's been no consensus on what's the best way of doing that. That's one big hole, as you've said, that we all are struggling with, and we all may have our own ideas, but I don't even know if we have formalized projects yet. But I think that's something where that's the, the sort of the best of science when you let little people come up with their own ideas choose the best of those, give them money, and then see what comes from that. So I, I, I like the idea very much of having that be an investigator-initiated approach. Yeah, and, and, and talking to people, uh, various people in the community, they were you know, excited about functional tests and validation, but they didn't want, they were really adamant about it not being the, the same production centers. You gotta really bring in some new blood, or open it up, let everybody compete, and get the best ideas, as Karen said. I would, I would put in two comments. The first is, um, I wholeheartedly agree, I think there are two scales to it. There is functional validation bound by the expert for a small number of things at exceptional depth of follow-up on the mechanism, which has huge value. And there is functional validation that is done more on a breadth scale, still in the biological system, still with uh, uh, an assay that needs to be done by, by the community, by, by, you know, investigator. And, and there has to be a balance in the portfolio between these because there is value in each. Um, and whether they're both done through the same mechanism, I don't know. And the other, because you posed it very specifically about the study section, this should be a special, em special emphasis uh, panel. I do not think that you would get the necessary expertise in the room in the standing study section, definitely not in GCAT, which is a great study section, but that's For not sure. its area of expertise. <laughs> Other comments? Are there other questions that other NIH staff want to ask? Yeah, John, go ahead. I, I want to make one comment um, regarding the sort of RFA versus GCAT, and I will disclose I'm a member of the GCAT study section, uh, that the, um, the problem with RFAs is that there's a timing issue, right? In some way, you just flush out what's ready, and you don't wait for things to develop. And I think the advantage of a program announcement, maybe with rolling receipt or whatever, yeah. And, and I think a study section like GCAT, as long as it was prepared and, and new, I don't know, I don't know, I haven't tracked the number, but my impression is that at least 20% of the members, uh, if not more, are recruited ad hoc to deal with the specific grants that, that come in. Um, it could be, could be, that number could even be much higher. So I don't think it's impossible, uh, uh, but, but they're, you know, I think the rolling aspect is the most important, yeah. is the fact not to capture one point in time. Yeah. Right. Okay, anything else? If not, I'll turn it over to Elise. Thank you. Okay, so I just want to uh, thank you all for, for being here. I had just a, some brief slides. 
Um, really just thanking everyone who um, who's helped organize this, this meeting, the organizing committee, and the um, co and co-consortium. And do we have do we have all that coming up? Just this one. Okay. So we really couldn't couldn't do this with the organizing committee. It really was uh, huge in in organizing the meeting as well as as um, leading the discussions and and synthesizing this. Um, it's been really uh, incredibly helpful, um, as well as as the um, Capital Consulting Corporation. So um, the Encode Consortium obviously uh, needs to be thanked again, uh, as well as the Encode External Consultants Panel. Um, and a big thanks to our colleagues in the uh, NHGRI Communications and Public Liaison Branch, specifically Alvaro Encinas and Kiara Palmer, who are in the back, who have been here with us the last two days and are, um, have made it possible to have the webcast and are doing this with a very rapid turnaround. It's already available. Last night's already available. So thank you very much for your hard work on that. Um, and then finally, my NHGRI colleagues. But most of all, I want to thank you, especially those of you who have stayed to the very end and. Uh, <laughs> You're, you're hearty, and uh, we really appreciate that everyone really did participate. We tried to keep this a small meeting so everyone felt comfortable to speak up, and I think it really worked. So thank you so much. Appreciate your help.